Um, yeah, so uh, I'm going to talk about unclonable encryption, and this is a, a joint work with uh, Fati Karyogu, who's a student at uh, UCSB, uh, Xing Zhang Li from uh, Xinghua, uh, Chi Peng from Simons, and Mark Sandry from NTD. Okay, so unclonable encryption comes under the umbrella of uh, a research area called unclonable cryptography, uh, which primarily deals with leveraging the principle of uh, no cloning. Uh, to build very interesting cryptographic primitives. So there are many interesting uh, uh, cryptographic primitives that come under unclonable cryptography. Uh, the most popular one being quantum money, which shows how to uh, yeah, associate digital money with money states in such a way that these states cannot be cloned. This was first introduced in 1983 by Weisner. Since then, there have been many interesting unclonable primitives. Uh, there's copy protection, which shows how to associate software with uh, quantum states in such a way that uh, these quantum states retain the functionality of the software, but at the same time, uh, you know, that any adversary entity cannot produce pirated copies of the software. And there is unclonable encryption, which I'm going to talk about, tokenized signatures, and more. Okay, so uh, the topic of uh, today's talk is uh, unclonable encryption. Let's see what it is. So this was uh, first introduced by uh, Broadbent and Lord in 2020. Uh, so an unclonable encryption is just like a regular encryption scheme, except that the ciphertext will be associated with a quantum state. Okay, so ciphertext is a quantum state. And in terms of functionality, it's the same as a uh, regular encryption. So uh, there's a decryption algorithm that given the ciphertext state and a decryption key can recover the message that is encrypted. Uh, what is different is the security notion. Uh, Informally speaking, what we want is that any adversarial entity should not be able to produce multiple copies of this ciphertext state. So formally, this is uh, uh, this is uh, formulated as a as a three part a three part adversary A B C uh, says that A receives as input uh, A or Alice receives as input a ciphertext state, and then it creates a bipartite state and gives it to Bob and Charlie. Uh, then Bob and Charlie are not supposed to talk to each other and they independently receive the secret key corresponding to the uh, unclonable encryption scheme. And then they're both uh, supposed to simultaneously output answers, answer B and answer C. So there are two types of security notions that we can consider here. One is a search security, where you are going to draw the message that is uh, encrypted uh, uh, uniformly at random from the set of all possible messages. And then you require that both Bob and Charlie simultaneously output the, this message. And the second security notion is the indistinguishability security notion, where uh, the message M is actually sampled from a set of uh, two messages, M0 and M1. You should think of M0 and M1 as being adversarially chosen. Um, and then this message is encrypted and give it to Alice. And in the end, Bob and Charlie are supposed to output, uh, are again supposed to guess the message. Um, so we have these two security notions. So how are these security notions related with each other? Um, so indistinguishability security notion is a stronger notion because it implies search. And it turns out that search security is somewhat very weak uh, in the sense that it doesn't even imply semantic security. Uh, if you're not familiar with what semantic security is, that you, know, it, you could have an unclonable encryption scheme that satisfies unclonable search security. But at the same time, somehow this ciphertext could leak some information about the message. Maybe it leaks the last few bits of the message. So the search security doesn't uh, you know, prohibit an adversary from learning some bits of the message. So typically, when people propose unclonable encryption scheme satisfying search security, so they additionally need to also prove semantic security on top of it. So in terms of uh, constructions, what do we know? So we know how to get unclonable encryption with satisfying search security uh, using BB84 states. This was shown in the, in the, uh, in the work by Broadbent and Lord. Uh, specifically, what they show is that uh, if the message is of length n, then the success probability of the adversary uh, is upper bounded by 0.85 to the n. So for uh, large n, the, the success probability of the adversary is very, very small. Okay. 
So in terms of unclonable indistinguishability, uh, we don't know a lot. Uh, we have some preliminary results where we can show how to go from one-time security to multi-time, uh, to uh, public key encryption in a generic way. Okay. But we don't know how to even construct a one-time secure unclonable uh, indistinguishable encryption. So uh, it's sort of clear that indistinguishability is harder to achieve than search security. Uh, so the sort of important question that has been left open from the past few works is uh, whether it's even possible to achieve unclonable indistinguishability. Uh, proving a positive or a negative result here would be very interesting. So even if you don't care about unclonable in, uh, indistinguishability, it turns out that answering this question has some implication to understanding the feasibility of copy protection for point functions. So it turns out that the techniques that are useful for proving the existence or, uh, uh, or, or the impossibility of unclonable indistinguishability can be sort of leveraged to correspondingly prove the positive result on copy protection or negative result on copy protection. Okay. So why is it so difficult to achieve? Why, why haven't we been able to uh, uh, achieve unclonable indistinguishability? Let me tell you some challenges. So the first challenge is that uh, in terms of the crypto primitives that we can use to achieve unclonable indistinguishability, there aren't a, a lot to choose from. And the reason is because if you look at the security game, so here, uh, you know, Bob and Charlie receive the secret key. So they receive all the secret information that is used in the system. Whereas if you look at cryptographic schemes, the security of cryptographic schemes sort of crucially rely upon the fact that there is some secret information that is hidden from the adversary. So these cryptographic schemes uh, can no longer be sort of useful in, in, uh, in building these, uh, in building unclonable encryption. So this is the first challenge. The second sort of related challenge is that, you know, when we use crypto primitives, one primitive to build another primitive, we need to uh, demonstrate or design security reductions. Uh, and in this setting, you know, uh, correspondingly, uh, we need to design what are called as simultaneous or non-local reductions. And the reason is because it's not one adversary who's breaking the uh, encryption scheme. Here we have two adversaries, Bob and Charlie, simultaneously breaking something. So we need to sort of leverage both of them simultaneously to break some assumption. And it turns out that non-local reductions are harder to design. Uh, and just to give you an example, a Goldrick Levin uh, reduction is something that is very popular in, in classical cryptography. And if you actually look at a simultaneous version of Goldrick Levin, uh, you know, we don't know how to design this. It, it seems like a very hard problem. So the third challenge is that, you know, uh, crypto 101 techniques like hybrid techniques sort of don't seem to work in the, in the unclonable indistinguishability setting. So let me give you an example. Um, so if I give you encryption for one bit messages and I ask you to convert this encryption into encryption for long messages, you know, the, the most standard way to do it is to encrypt this long message bit by bit. And you can uh, use the hybrid technique to argue that the resulting scheme is secure. But it turns out that this sort of fails in the unclonable uh, setting. Okay? So it's not an artifact of the proof. In fact, you can show that if you do this transformation, the resulting encryption scheme is actually insecure, even, even if you started off with a scheme that was secure. So it seems like whatever we know in classical cryptography, you know, sort of don't seem to uh, work in the unclonable setting. Uh, and the fourth challenge is that there are there are actually some uh, uh, limited negative results known on feasibility of unclonable encryption, which makes it harder to construct uh, construct this object. Um, Bachans et al. showed that if you have an unclonable encryption scheme where the ciphertext have uh, where the ciphertext represented as density matrices have large eigenvalues, uh, uh, then this is sort of impossible to achieve. Okay. So whatever unclonable indistinguishable encryption that you come up with should be such that the ciphertext should have uh, small eigenvalues. Okay, so uh, keeping all these challenges in mind, uh, we show the uh, following results. So we show that in the quantum random oracle model, uh, unclonable indistinguishability does exist. Uh, and uh, using similar techniques, we show how to construct copy protection for uh, one-bit output point functions. Okay. And 
uh, you can ask the question whether we really need quantum random oracle uh, to construct this object. Uh, and it turns out that there is some uh, evidence to believe that unclonable encryption in the plane model is impossible. Specifically, we show that deterministic unclonable encryption is, uh, is impossible. Uh, by deterministic, what I mean is that uh, you should think of the encryption as a unitary, and the decryption algorithm is uh, inverse of this unitary. Just to give you some perspective, um, as I said, like we didn't know anything about unclonable indistinguishability before, so this is the first feasibility result on unclonable encryption. Similarly, this is the first uh, feasibility result for copy protection as well. And in terms of negative result, uh, as a consequence, we show that some unclonable encryption schemes that satisfy search security do not satisfy indistinguishability security, like the, the scheme by uh, Broadbent and Lord. Uh, this was already shown before by much chance at all, uh, but we give like an alternate proof of this fact. Okay. So let's dive into the uh, technical details. So let me start with uh, proving the impossibility of uh, deterministic control encryption schemes. So central to proving this theorem is this uh, very nice result by Meiji et al, who show the following. So suppose let's say I give you two n qubit hard states, psi zero and psi one. Okay. And then you need to look at the reduced density matrix on the first n qubits of both these states. Let me call them rho zero and rho one. Uh, you can actually show that the trace distance between these two uh, uh, um, states is roughly 0.568. This concept is not important. What you need to remember is that it's sort of bounded away from half. And this is something that we're going to crucially use later on. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Okay. So, Keeping this tool in mind, here is the attack. So we, again, uh, we are trying to rule out the existence of uh, deterministic unclonable uh, encryption. So our goal is to simultaneously distinguish uh, uh, these two states, psi zero and psi one, where psi zero is the encryption algorithm applied on M zero. And here the encryption algorithm is just a unitary U. And then similarly, psi one is a unitary applied on M one. Okay. So you can show that uh, attacking this scheme boils down to uh, you know winning in the following game. So what in this game, the adversary is given a state psi b, where b is a bit picked uniformly at random. So it's either given psi zero or psi one with uh, with the same probability. And then Alice creates a bipartite state, and then both Bob and Charlie receive uh, uh, the description of the two states psi zero and psi one. And then the goal of Bob and Charlie is to uh, uh, output the bit B. You haven't written here, uh, both Bob and Charlie need to output the same bit B. That's when they win. I want to argue that the probability that they simultaneously win is uh, bounded away from half. So note that you know th this game is, uh, is more restrictive than the unclonable encryption security because in the unclonable encryption security, both Bob and Charlie receive the unitary that sort of creates the states. But here, I'm just giving you one copy of the state. And I'm, showing, I'm going to show you that even in that case, uh, the attack works. Okay. So here is where we need to use this result. Uh, so just to give you some intuition as to why this, this result is useful here. So uh, note that from Bob's perspective, he sees the first n qubits of psi b. So think of Alice as really dividing whatever state it gets into half and giving the first half to Bob and the second half to Charlie. So Bob sees like the first half of the state and it needs to distinguish whether this first half corresponds to psi zero or psi one. And using this result, you can show that you can do it with probability point, uh, again, bounded away from half. Symmetrically, you can also show that Charlie can do the same thing. The, the, the Charlie can actually distinguish whether its half corresponds to psi zero or psi one with probability bounded away from half. And then you doing a lot of tedious calculations, you can show that they can both simultaneously uh, sort of distinguish whether the state corresponds to psi zero or psi one with probability bounded away from half. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm skipping a lot of these, uh, the calculations that lead here, but, but the major at all result is sort of the central tool to, to achieving this, uh, to proving this theorem. Okay. Okay. So let's uh, look at uh, the feasibility result. So recall that we show uh, the existence of unclonable indistinguishability in the quantum random oracle model. 
So the starting point to proving the feasibility result is uh, using monogamy of entanglement games. And the reason why we are starting with this is because this, these were useful to achieving uh, search security of unclonable encryption in the past. So maybe let's try to use this to also get indistinguishability security. Okay. So the ideal goal would be to start from some uh, monogamy game that we design and use this to construct indistinguishability based uh, unclonable encryption. And in some sense, I think of this as search to decision reduction because monogamy game is more like a search game and indistinguishability based uh, uh, unclonable encryption is more like a decision game. So typically, search to decision reductions in the unclonable setting is hard. So let's try to leverage the, the fact that we are working in the quantum random oracle model and, and do this reduction. So what we show is that we start with a decision coset game, which I'm going to uh, define in a second. Uh, in the quantum random oracle model, and then we will show how to turn this game into an unclonable, uh, indistinguishable uh, encryption scheme in the quantum random oracle model. Okay, so, uh, if you're not familiar with what coset states are, uh, this is of the form A S S prime, where A is a subspace and S and S prime are coset representatives, uh, and they are uh, a uniform superposition over all the elements in the coset A plus S. Okay, uh, and the way to think about this phase is apply QFT on the state. So you're going to end up with uh, uniform superposition over all the elements in A per plus S prime. Uh, I'm not normalizing the state, but yeah, it's, it's a uniform superposition over all the elements. Um, and if you're familiar with BB84 states and subspace states, coset states generalize both these types of states. So the sort of the takeaway property from uh, coset states is that if I give you the state, and I also give you the description of the subspace uh, A, then you can actually recover the coset representatives S and S prime efficiently. This is something you need to remember. Okay, okay. so let, let me define the coset game. Uh, so in this game, Alice gets us input the coset state. And additionally, it also gets us input H of S S prime. Think of H as a, a hash function. Uh, in the security proof, you're gonna model H as a random oracle. And this hedge of SS prime is explored with a bit B, okay, which is this bit B is picked uniformly at random. So then Alice uh, creates the bipartite state, and then both Bob and Charlie simultaneously receive the description of the subspace A, uh, and then they're both supposed to simultaneously output B to win the game. So the ideal guarantee, what we want is that the probability that any adversary wins in this game should be at most half plus something very, very small, something negligible in it. Okay. So just to get a bit more intuition about this game, so note that it's important that the subspace A is not revealed to uh, Alice. Because if the subspace A is revealed to Alice, then Alice receives as input the coset state, it receives as input the subspace, then it can re uh, recover the coset representatives S and S prime, compute H of S S prime, and then recover B. So it's sort of important that A is hidden until uh, 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 the, the phase where Bob and Charlie are executed. Okay. So it would have been great if we could just work with this game. Unfortunately, we need a stronger version of this game where uh, Alice, Bob, and Charlie all need to have access to some oracle. Okay. So it's not one oracle. This actually consists of three oracles. Uh, where uh, one of the oracles is the hash function that you need to give uh, oracle access to. The other two oracles uh, do the following. Uh, they help you test membership in the, uh, in the coset A plus S and A plus S prime. Okay. So given an element, uh, P A, A plus S tells, uh, outputs one if it, the element belongs to a, uh, the coset A plus S. Uh, and correspondingly, you can define P A A plus S prime as well. So what we show is that uh, you know the, the probability that any adversary win, uh, wins in the game is at most half plus uh, something negligible in n. Yep. So uh, I'm going to do the proof of this uh, later, but let's see why this game is useful for our purpose. Okay. So the intuition is that you should really think of this bit b as the message being encrypted. So whatever Alice receives is the ciphertext. So the ciphertext consists of the coset state, and it consists of H of S S prime XOR with B. Okay. And uh, A, should, you should think of A as being the secret key, or the decryption key. Okay. 
So if you think of it this way, this exactly matches the syntax of the unclonable uh, indistinguishable security. Right? So in more detail, the construction is as follows. Uh, the secret key uh, uh, it, it consists of the subspace of some non-trivial dimension that is sampled uh, uh, uniformly at random. Uh, and the encryption uh, uh, algorithm does the following. It samples random coset representatives as an S prime. And then it computes the coset state ASS prime. And then it outputs this coset state. Along with it, it also outputs it of SS prime XORed with the message. So here I'm considering uh, encryption of single bit messages, but correspondingly, uh, you can um, uh, adapt the same technique to also uh, achieve encryption for long messages. Okay. Okay. So now that we saw how the coset game was useful for building and clonable encryption, let's see how to uh, prove the uh, the security of this coset game. So recall that we need to show this, that the, the success probability of the adversary in this game is uh, at most half plus something small. So the starting point is to look at a search version of this game that we know. Uh, in the search version, Alice only receives his input a coset state. Uh, Bob and Charlie receive the description of the subspace as before. But now Bob and Charlie are supposed to output the coset representatives S and S prime. So we are asking uh, the adversary to do more in, in this game. And it was proven in a previous work by Colored Angelo et al. that the success probability of the adversary in this game is, uh, uh, is something, again, very, very small. It's something negligible in N. Okay. Okay. So the idea is to, you know, we know this, the, that this uh, search game uh, uh, exists, and we need to prove the decision game, so we'll do a search to decision reduction in the quantum random oracle model. So uh, just recall that you know Bo Alice, Bob, and Charlie have access to this combined oracle. But for simplicity, I'm only going to consider the case when all of them have access to the random oracle, and I'm going to uh, ignore the other two oracles. So the other two oracles will be invisible. Okay. okay. So for simplicity, let's consider a, a weaker adversary uh, where Alice outputs unentangled states to Bob and Charlie. So whatever Bob and Charlie receive are unentangled. Okay, so the first step uh, to proving the security in this case is to sort of puncture the random oracle at SS prime. So this sort of ensures that Alice receives no information about SS prime here. And once you do this, then the next step would be to sort of measure the random oracle queries made by both Bob and Charlie. Okay, uh, and you measure Bob's query, you get XB, and you measure Charlie's query, you get XC, and Bob outputs XB and Charlie outputs XC. And you can argue that if both uh, Bob and Charlie simultaneously predict the bit B with uh, probability half plus one or poly, then the probability that you know XB is going to be SS prime and XC is going to be SS prime is also one or poly. Okay. So uh, the search to decision reduction works in this case. So I don't think I have time to uh, do the general case when when uh, Alice actually outputs a, a, an entangled state to Bob and Charlie. Uh, there are a lot of like dirty calculations that you need to do, so I'm going to skip all of them. Um, okay, so let me just jump right into conclusion. Uh, so what we show is the impossibility of uh, uh, unclonable, uh, deterministic unclonable encryption. Um, and we show that uh, for the first time that unclonable encryption satisfying indistinguishability is possible in the quantum random oracle model. So something that is sort of still open, uh, it's a very important problem, is to understand whether unclonable encryption is even possible in the plain model. All right. um, and this is sort of uh, related to some uh, fundamental questions related to unclonable primitives. For example, if you can solve simultaneous goldrick levin reduction, then uh, you can actually show that unclonable encryption does exist in the plain model. Uh, and there are also problems related to like uh, uh, generic transformations between challenge distributions. Uh, for decision games, which would also have some implications on clone encryption. So, um, please work on it. Uh, yeah, thank you. There's one there. Oh. 
Hi, thank you for your talk. Um, so you said that you think, at least, that uh, there are some evidences showing that uh, even non-deterministic uncloudable encryption would be impossible in the plain model. Do you think that this would also apply for copy protection of point functions? Oh, so uh, oh, so you're asking if the the impossibility of deterministic uncloudable encryption has implications to deterministic. That's a good question. I would. Um, yeah, the problem is that they're related uh, not in a generic sense. Uh, for some reason, the techniques sort of work with each other. So I, uh, I can't say off the top of my head that techniques do work there. Uh, well, that's, that's a good question. Yeah. Hi, thank you for the talk. It was very nice. Um, it's a potentially a stupid question, uh, but I just wanted to know if the when you say that you've constructed in the quantum random oracle model, there were other oracles that were involved. Uh, can they also be constructed from a random oracle? Or oh, good, good. So those oracles only show up in a security proof, um, but in the construction, only uh, use only random oracle. Yeah. Okay, thank you. That's a good question. Yeah. Hi, thanks for your talk. So um, I was just wondering, could you clarify again, uh, I probably missed it, why the psi naught and psi one states that you used in the impossibility had to be hard random? Um, well, why does it have to be hard random? It's just that uh, uh, we knew a result for hard states. Okay. Uh, in fact, it's harder to show for this case, but someone had already done it, so we just used it. Okay. Okay. Uh, uh, probably, uh, you know, for, for uh, you might be able to uh, come up with a better bound if you're working with uncloned encryption directly. Yeah. What was the specific property that you needed to satisfy with these states? Um, that these hard states happen to satisfy? Uh, they're just hard states. There's no other property you need to satisfy. No, no, no. But okay. So you you said they had this property which you used, right? Um, so oh, 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 uh, that, that, like, if you look at the first n qubits of two hard states, uh -huh. then the trace distance between the reduced density matrices should be, like, bounded away from half. Okay, I see, I see. Yeah, that's the property we use. Okay. Yeah. So, one more question. Um, I guess you said that, uh, I mean, okay, how much water do you, I guess you said there's evidence for, like, it holds in the non deterministic case as well, so maybe... Um, yeah, maybe give some intuition because just, I mean, deterministic encryption, it doesn't even give you NCPA security, right? So, um, actually, this, we are dealing with one times uh, uh, encryption scheme. For one time, you can actually construct deterministic encryption. Oh, right. So, um, but you're right. I mean, it could be the case that you might be able to use, uh, you know, maybe a channel as an encryption algorithm and circumvent it. Yeah, I don't, we don't have evidence to believe either way. Yeah. Yeah, thanks.